Did pollination first evolve in the sea? Welcome to Answers News for Monday, August 8th, 2022. Hi, I'm Tim Chafee, and I'm joined today by Patricia Angler and Dr. Kaya Kloster, and we're going to be covering uh, several news items for you in just a little bit. We're going to be discussing uh, science and social issues from a biblical perspective. And first, just want to remind everybody, uh, normally we would do the show on Mondays and Wednesdays, but uh, for the time being, we're just going to be doing Mondays at 2 o'clock. And we do have a live audience here today at the Creation Museum, so you guys go ahead and give yourselves a hand and let everybody out there hear you. All right. Great to have you guys here today. And of course, we've got people tuning in on social media as well. So let's jump into those topics. And this first one here is these pollinating crustaceans are the bees of the sea. And so what this article is about is this, uh, this little critter, is, they observed it um, pollinating uh, red algae. And for a long time, they thought that you know, these insects were only used on land to, uh, to pollinate plants, but now they think that they've got evidence that they can also pollinate uh, plants in the water. So what do you think? Yeah. I think it was some, some really good science. They, what they did was they took an aquarium and they'd had a female plant and a male plant. And then in one aquarium, they put the little crustaceans and in the other one, they did not. And there was 20 times more pollination between those plants in the one that had the crustaceans. And then they also found that they could take the crustaceans from one of the aquariums that had a male plant and move it over to the aquarium that had the female plants. And they also then had fertilization. So they also could see the little tiny um, spermatia, the little um, po pollination type things that actually fertilize. And so they were demonstrated scientifically to, to be active in that in the sea, which was a first. Yeah, for sure. Um, and like you said, that's just good observational science. It's a cool research design. But since they started with evolutionary worldview presuppositions, mm -hmm. then they began to ask the wrong questions like, OK, so which evolved first? Assuming that evolution happened, did it evolve first in the sea or on the land? Because how evolution supposedly evolved on the land has been a problem for evolutionists. Even uh, Darwin, back when he was looking at flowering plants, said the rapid development, as far as we can judge, of all the higher plants within recent geological times is, he called it, an abominable mystery. So then um, they're, they're asking, okay, so now you don't just have a mystery on the land, you have it in the, the sea too. And then, um, as I think you were saying earlier, Tim, you have a male and female here going on as well with mm -hmm. pollination, so then how did that evolve? Right, from an evolutionary perspective, if, thing, if the first life form that ever evolved is, is asexual, it can reproduce by itself, it doesn't need a, a partner, it doesn't need to have the male and female, why would you ever evolve the two different parts? That, that you have, have to have two different mm -hmm. uh, specimens in order to, to multiply. It would be so much easier if it's just the one. So mm -hmm. why would evolution make something far more complex if, if that was how things really happened? And then we'll get answers like, well, it's because then you're able to keep the species strong or they're there. But evolution doesn't think through those things and it can't plan that in advance to say, you know, if we were to do this, I mean, so there's no way to do it. Uh, but this article talks about how, you know, the, the plants that moved ashore 450 million years ago and red algae arising, you know, 800 million years ago. So of course they're putting their, their storytelling into, the, into what really was good observational science. And uh, so be able to separate the, the fact from the fiction, be able to, when you're reading an article like this, be able to look at what was observed and then what is the story that they're, they're attaching to it. What's the worldview and how they're interpreting that data? Uh, because they can do good science, and in this case, they did. Right, and they had actually a couple theories. One was that maybe instead of evolving on land, it evolved in the ocean and then in, on the land. Um, or they said maybe it evolved separately in two different times. And again, like the, the odds for it developing once and then for it to happen two different times um, is really astronomically difficult. Um, but rather, I think it's just a great example of symbiosis where um, they live in this great harmony together where one complements the other. And, and in all honesty, it just shows a great example of design. Absolutely, because you see so many of those systems in biology, right? Mm -hmm. Like all these interdependent components yeah, working together at the same time. So you actually have a lot of like the kind of chicken and egg dilemmas. Mm -hmm. So then they have to ask, okay, well, which evolved first? But from a biblical perspective, you don't even have that problem. Right. It's just, again, points to a very good designer. 
Right, and that's important to what Patricia just brought up, that from a biblical perspective, this isn't a problem. So, but think about it for the Christians who want to add the hundreds of millions or the billions of years to the Bible. You've got these plants, because a lot of times, like this day-age theory, where each of the days is really long periods of time. So the plants are created on day three, right? But the things that are going to pollinate the plants, the insects, the crustaceans, the other things, are not going to be until day five. And if each of these days are hundreds of millions of years long, how are those plants surviving for all of that time without something to pollinate it? Right. But from a biblical perspective, there's no problem there because they can survive for the you know, a day and a half or two days or so until God makes those, the other creatures that are going to come along and do the pollination. Sure. Uh, so it's not a problem from a biblical perspective, but if you're trying to cram that billions of years into the Bible, you create a lot of issues uh, and that's just one of them in this situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could say like maybe it was like some water movement or wind movement that got some pollen moving, but it's still less efficient for one thing. And like even an article from Science in 2020 had said originally, trying to get around this problem a little bit, evolutionists thought, well, maybe wind pollination evolved first and then insect pollination. But then in 2020, they're like, well, that seems like an oversimplification. In other ways, the actual science, the, the evidence that we see that we can observe doesn't match that evolutionary assumption. So again, like you really can't get around the need for the designer. And, and not only that, um, where did the pollen come from in the first place? It's almost as if somebody designed these things to work exactly like they do, and it was really intelligent. <laughs> that, that's exactly what we observed. Absolutely. So what we're seeing in this article and so many others, it lines up exactly with, with scripture. It does not match an evolutionary view, even though they'll try to fit it in there. All right, well, let's move on to our next article, and that is Biden's Title IX rule could mean your daughter's college roommate will be a man. And uh, so if you're not familiar with Title IX, Title IX was something that was passed uh, several decades ago that was, I think, largely to do with women's sports. That if, a, if a college offered you know, four collegiate sports for men, they also have to offer four collegiate sports for women. And uh, so they, they had to have this equality in that sense. They didn't have to be the exact same sport, but just have the same amount of opportunity. And it's also now being applied to um, who's going to be living in what dorms, and you're not allowed to ask certain questions. So I'll take it away. Yeah, I mean, one thing we can really see going on here is the redefinition of language. Um, that really stands out to me. For instance, this is called a law against sex discrimination, which sounds good. However, if you look at um, old medical dictionaries, for instance, and you look at um, sex versus gender, they were used interchangeably to mean like biological sex. However, then we've seen more recently um, them bringing in the definition, distinguishing that between your gender identity, which is how you feel on the inside. But now with this law, they're bringing even the word sex, which originally meant biology and genetics, under this umbrella of gender identity too. So it's shifted completely the other way. So now you only have feelings as the authority for truth. And it's, um, it's just all uh, feelings and mansard that's the authority for defining language now. And then whoever has the power to define language can define truth, and that has legal implications. You're, you're actually completely redefining guilt and innocence now as well. Well, and they're not obligated to let you know who your roommate is either. And so, um, and, and so someone who maybe, some may have begun to identify as a female maybe when they were 13, some may have decided last month. And you know they can come and, and be a roommate and um, you don't have to be told. And if you complain against it, then there, you can get what's called a Title IX complaint uh, imposed against you. And the institutions that try to go against this will have fines and um, certain repercussions as well, a lack of federal funding, things like that. And so there's a lot of consequences. Uh, there are, and, and yeah, consequences of those young girls who are off in college and get stuck with a male roommate. Um, you know, hopefully nothing would happen, but these schools are supposed to be protecting students from any sort of sexual assault or putting them into places where that's going to happen. And yet inevit inevitably, that is what you're going to be in danger of of endorsing or, or at least opening these students up to. And then they can't say anything about it. I mean, what, how awful mm -hmm. would that be? Um, but then this, is, this plays right into women's sports as well, because you know, Title IX originally was to create a platform where women would have an opportunity to have sports. And now these things are the, the same sort of things being used where men can suddenly identify as a woman and dominate that female sport, like we've seen with the Penn State swimmer this past year, and it's happened in other ones as well. 
So. Yeah. Um, but Patricia, you were talking about language a little while ago, who, who defines the language. It's interesting because postmodernists are the ones who really play this game. And this is something that's been going on in our culture for about 70 to 80 years. And now we've really seen it thrown mainstream in the last two decades or so. But they play word games. They redefine words constantly. And yet they were the ones, the way they get people on board is complain about how people, the, the oppressors will use language to oppress people. What are they doing? Mm -hmm. They're changing the meaning of words and they're playing word games to oppress people. They're giant hypocrites. They're doing the exact same thing that they've accused other people of doing and many times without any evidence for that, uh, but they're just doing it. And, and you made a great point of you know, the fact that you know, they're, they're trying to be so conscientious of offending, but it's actually such a minority. And, and in, in reality, they're actually offending probably a majority. Well, would yeah, it's uh, caused some, some anxiety probably to, say, women going into dorm rooms not knowing maybe who your roommate's going to be. But, um, yeah, it does kind of show that equality isn't necessarily what they're really going for or they would consider the anxiety of mm -hmm. the women and also equally protecting safety for everyone. And the author does mention a couple ways you could do that. For instance, having a little checkbox to say, who are you comfortable rooming with? So there are ways that you could get around this. But they're this, not going to do that. It, it doesn't seem likely. So one thing I'd maybe recommend is if you're going to be going to a secular university um, to, to like, for instance, what I did, I didn't have to live in dorms at all. I went to some churches beforehand, put some bulletins out, you know, on their, on their posters there on the church walls asking like, hey, are there any couples here, Christian couples that I could room with? You know, look for, look for rent renting situations maybe outside the dorm room, find some Christians to stay with. That worked for me really well. And then you also get some built-in Christian mentorship that way as well. And you had mentioned that you know, they, they talk about how they are concerned for the women or they're concerned for these other groups or in protecting these groups. Actually, what they're really concerned about is tearing down society. It's continually uh, trying to break down the Judeo-Christian worldview to tear apart the family, which then tear, tears apart the society. And that's been the goal of postmodernism all along. It's sort of like Marxism light, and you tear down those structures, and we're seeing that happening in our day. So they're not interested in protecting women or children or any other group. They're interested in, in revolution. That's ultimately what they want, and that's been their stated goal all along. You just have to be aware of that. So. It does mention uh, like an online portal where you can weigh in and, you know, if the, if the public speaks out against things like this, we do have a voice. Right. And so there are some ways to, to speak into this. Good point. Well, let's hope that enough people do. All right. So uh, a similar topic. We've got a, the doomed UK trans kids clinic left thousands of damaged children in its wake. And so this article is about the, the Tavistock Center, which is... Uh, the acronym they use is uh, GIDS, the Gender Identity Development Service. And it's over in the UK. And what they've been doing is it appears that they've been rushing a lot of people, especially young girls, into these, um, taking these drugs for transitioning and to become male and taking these hormones and encouraging surgeries and all that kind of stuff. Uh, many times for reasons that are just absurd. It's not that the person actually has any sort of gender dysphoria. It's in one case, an autistic girl, a 13 year old girl who happened to like Thomas the Tank Engine, therefore she must be really a male. And so they need to encourage her to be uh, taking, starting these, this treatment. Um, so uh, this is a, a clinic that uh, has been, they've suspended the service for now. And we'll see what happens. I think it's gonna be closing down next year and it's under investigation. And there's been a lot of complaints and whistleblowers and. Um, one organization called the Mermaids Organization, they've been campaigning for puberty blockers to be given to as young as 12-year-olds. And one of the things that they say is that these are um, completely reversible. And as a physiologist, I can tell you that a lot of the things that they're doing to these young people are not reversible. Um, so actually, you know, a couple of the quotes at the end of this article, I, I just was so glad to see some of the leaders in England, in fact, some that are maybe going to be stepping into to quite high leadership roles, um, you know, they talk about, we have a responsibility to those under 18 to shield them from irreversible decisions that will affect them for the rest of their lives. And so um, I guess we just have to hope that some of that reason gets into their legislation there. Yeah, because this is just one clinic. There are lots of these things. And th there's one that's being shut down because of some very clear abuses and complaints going on for, what did it say, 18 years mm -hmm. or something. And so that's how long it's taken to get this one place shut down. But there are other ones. And so don't think that in the UK this has suddenly stopped. It's not. Um, and we see this going on in the US all over the place. So this is, this is happening here too. I mean, we're offering um, 
these drugs, like for young girls, you know, as young as 11 or 12, who think that they're really a boy all of a sudden, be, a lot of times because of peer pressure, because that's what they're being told by their teachers or other people, that they're supposed to get testosterone. And they get to self-diagnose that, and then they go in and get to demand that, and you're not allowed to turn them down. I mean, that's how, how crazy it is right now. So. For sure. And one thing on that note that kind of stood out to me was just a little bit of the ironic inconsistency going on here in that uh, the movement that you know, we're seeing in the kind of what we call progressive is against, supposedly against gender stereotypes and cultural stereotypes of gender and against the idea of a gender binary anyway. And yet they're using stereotypes like liking Thomas the Tank Engine. I mean, there's nothing in science or the Bible that indicates that girls shouldn't like stories about trains. But anyway, they're using these stereotypes that they're creating to then try to encourage kids to cross gender binaries when they don't they don't say that they believe in either of those things. Mm -hmm. So just, just an interesting um, note about the inconsistencies there. But if you've given up the foundation for truth, God, then you have given up the foundation for logic as well and for thinking about inconsistencies. So actually you see a lot of um, these movements are not only comfortable with inconsistencies, but they believe inconsistency is necessary to drive the process of cultural evolution. So. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, if, if there is really no male or female and it's just all how you feel, how can you say that certain things are... Um, male or female. Male or female. <laughs> how can you say, yeah, exactly, that, that males would generally like this more and females would generally like this. Right. If, if you can't say those things, you can't identify those things, then how can you say somebody should transition because they happen to like that right. thing? So, yeah, great point. It's a great point. And, and so we're seeing that in... Uh, yeah, it's, it's very tragic what's happening to young people and what they're being pushed into uh, these ideologies and uh, with the different pronouns and uh, it's, uh, yeah, some of the videos you watch. It's right. <laughs> um, very interesting. So we live in a difficult time and be praying for those kids that are out there because they face a lot of pressures that many of us never faced. I mean, I don't think that, I don't like to think that I was in school that long ago, although I know exactly how many years it was because it's one of those this is my high school reunion years, so I know it's a multiple of five. I won't tell you how many of those. but um, <laughs> And so I don't think it was, I like to think, it, well, it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that bad. And it wasn't that bad. But things have changed drastically in the last 10 to 15 years. So be aware of that. And I think to that point, I mean, you used to get to be a, a tomboy. You, you, you know, you used to right. be able to be a girl that likes to climb trees and get dirty and not wear dresses. And, um, and then later you And that could, was okay. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. And then later you could realize, no, I'm a young lady and I'm want to have a family and I want to, and those opportunities are now being robbed from some, some of the kids that do some of these irreversible. Yeah, sometimes if, if you have a tomboy in school now, they're being told they're really a male mm -hmm. or that they, need to, that they need to be looking at right. a young lady rather mm -hmm. than, at, right. at, yeah, it's just the pressures that they're facing from their teachers and from fellow students and from the TV shows and everywhere else. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's tragic. All right, should we get on to something a little more fun? Let's, let's do some science, All right. we? So let's, let's talk about pandas. Not pandas in China, but pandas in Europe. Did you know that Europe used to have some pandas? And so this one is Europe's last pandas were giant weaklings who couldn't even eat bamboo. All right, so this story comes uh, as a result of examining two panda teeth that were found uh, back in the 1970s and then were just kind of put in a box for 40 years, which by the way, that happens a lot in science where they, there are so many discoveries. Some of you who are interested in science, you could have an entire career just going through the collections room at, a certain, mu at certain museums and finding stuff that they've cataloged and that they just haven't been able to go through and, and put on display or really study it yet. But in this case, they found these two teeth that they identify as being panda teeth and they put this date on it and they think these, this is the last species of panda in Europe. You know, and again, it's just that um, I, I don't think I really realized until I started asking questions for myself about how fragmentary the evidence is, like the, the conclusions that they draw from such sparse evidence. Um, so there are two teeth, and in fact, there may be some unique qualities of panda teeth because they are, um, they do eat vegetation, and so they maybe are a little bit different than other bears. Um, but Although most bears eat vegetation. Actually, yeah, right, they're all omnivores. <laughs> so whether it's even unique enough to put them in the panda family, I, you know, I'm not 100% sure myself but um, but the fact is is from this um, they, they have put all these lineages and what bears they think were first and second and how they evolved and um, but the thing is 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 that uh, again they were bears developed to do what they do best and and just reminded again in Genesis 130 if you remember way back at the beginning all were vegetation vegetarian um, and so it's not surprising that bears would have teeth that could be good at, at eating vegetation 
Um, you know, I went and looked at the original article. I think that's another thing to be really careful of. Mm -hmm. um, so often what we get is somebody's condensed version of a scientific article. Um, and I know a lot of people don't have access or interest to go to those, but if you do and when you do, you'll find that honestly, the authors are far more honest about their interpretation and the results sometimes than what we end up getting just in popular literature. So some of the con very conclusive statements that they drew, if you go into the, the author's article originally, he hedges more and says, oh, yeah. we Might think... Might have, may have. May have, exactly. you know, it looks like we Could need more been. evidence. Um, but by the time the public gets to digest this, it's, it's a sales pitch for evolution. It is, and then they usually give you a, a clickbait headline, you know, gi that were giant, giant weaklings, weaklings who right? couldn't even... Well, they don't know for sure if they can no, even... There's no <laughs> muscles that have right. been found. Right. Right. Yeah. So you, you got to have a title that catches people's attention. Where people, well, I got to read that, and mm -hmm. that's. Um, yeah. So. yeah, that is a good point for critical thinking. Just go back, check the source. That's one of the things I really encourage students to do. And actually, I think I did write a blog post. If you go to answersandgenesis.org, um, how to find and read scientific studies. So then that'll give you some tips for how to do um, what you've just talked about. Go back, check the original resource, uh, research, and go through and see, okay, so how is the information actually collected? Is it being reported accurately? Because yeah, a lot of times these pop science places will even draw sensational conclusions beyond what the researchers right. claimed. So yeah, just some, some good critical thinking tips for you there. Mm -hmm. And this one also has a lot of that evolutionary storytelling where this was six million years ago is when this one died out. And, and so they spin this whole story about, you know, bear evolution and everything. But, you know, from a biblical perspective, there were two bears on board Noah's Ark. And these are, this is a post-flood uh, species that we find. So it's something that derived from the two bears on Noah's Ark. And maybe it was a weaker one. I mean, if you think of our dog kind today, there's so much variation within the dog kind. Uh, you can have like the gray wolf and you can have, you know, coyotes or dingoes, these nice strong dogs, or you could have a poodle or a chihuahua. Those okay, that's going to be too ones. weak to even <laughs> eat bamboo or whatever it might be. You know, they're so they're sickly and weak and everything because they've lost so much genetic genetic information. It's not an evolutionary thing. It's actually the opposite of evolution. They're losing genetic information, and the same thing's happening with these bears as well. Uh, for whatever reason, these ones do not seem to have been suited well to survive at losing it, certain It does genetic talk about maybe a massive climate change, and again, the flood would have absolutely been that that tipping point where perhaps the environment that it thrived in was no longer available to it, and so could have led to its extinction. Right, they talk about it being during the Mediterranean, the salinity crisis that, that we would look at as being part of a post-flood environment. Some of the, the earth still reeling as a result of the flood and eventually you get this ice age and everything that was triggered by that. So yeah, there's still a lot of change going on in the world after the flood. So, well, should we move on to the next one? We've got a mammal ancestor looked like a chubby lizard with a tiny head and had a hippo-like lifestyle. That's quite a mouthful. So this is a creature, let me see if I can pronounce this, uh, Leluterhynchus. That uh, I might have said that correctly. <laughs> I don't know about that first part. But um, actually this is a, if you try to picture a, a huge turtle without a shell, it's sort of that. Um, and we actually have, uh, as part of the caseid kind, uh, we have down at the Ark Encounter a Cotylorhynchus, which would be a relative of this one. It would be a member of a different species within that same kind. And you can see a sculpt of two of those down at the Ark. They do kind of look like giant turtles without the shell. Uh, but they're classified as, um, not as reptiles, not as mammals. They're classified as synapsids, which is, they'll say like mammal-like reptile or reptile-like mammal. And in this story, or in this article, they're telling you these are the ancestors of mammals. And all right. Yep, this is just one of those classic cases, I guess, where you have an article that's giving you a lot of facts that are, well, statements that are presented as facts, but they're actually interpretations based on a lot of evolutionary assumptions, right? So you have to ask, okay, what's fact that we can observe? What's an interpretation based on these evolutionary assumptions? And then what's an alternative biblical explanation? So did they find the whole so. skeleton here? Is that, did they find a lot of evidence no. for this? Okay. <laughs> they had said two ribs and then a femur and a shoulder, bone, shoulder, shoulder blade. Bone. Right. So um, now if we know it's like a casid, we know maybe more about that genus from other specimens. Um, and if those bones fit closely enough with that, then maybe some of these assumptions are okay. But, but when you look at it, I mean, it says a tiny head and there's no skull. And it talks about, you know, this um, hippo-like lifestyle. So anyway, there's just all these kind of conjecture so that we can It's like a there. hippo the way it lives, but its bones are very different than hippo's bones. Right, it's got these right. spongy Everything bones. Where it's, oh, yeah, but hippos don't have that kind of bone. And, right. Because they learn to thrive on land a lot, yeah. even though a lot of times they're in the water. It, 
there is a lot of storytelling mm -hmm. here. Uh, it's an interesting find, and they're very weird-looking creatures. So, like, if you are heading down to the Ark Encounter on deck one, you can go see Cotylorhynchus. You might look at it and think, that is a bizarre-looking creature. Well, it, there are some strange-looking creatures from, that we find from the fossil record. There's some strange-looking creatures today. Okay, um, so we just often don't think of them as being strange because we're used to seeing them. But if, if you saw it for the first yeah. time, like the platypus, you think, that is a really weird looking creature. It's kind of cute and kind of cool, but it, it's pretty bizarre too. Yep. And I think yep. we side railed you. So where were you headed with that? Oh, well, just even like back to the first, uh, first sentence here of the article. It says, yeah, an animal that lived before dinosaurs, stated like his fact, looked like a rotund lizard with a very small head, hippo-like, semi-aquatic lifestyle, according to fossils. Okay, well, first of all, fossils don't speak for themselves, do they? So that's, this is called a reification fallacy. We are ascribing something concrete to something that's abstract, saying like fossils can speak when they mm -hmm. can't. Can parrot fossils speak? I hope not. No, I don't think <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be strange. <laughs> yeah. um, and then just saying, like, a fact it lived before dinosaurs, you can't observe that. What you can observe is the layers that it's buried in. It's buried below the dinosaurs. But from a biblical perspective, we would kind of expect that of semi-aquatic creatures to be buried maybe before earlier land creatures. than yeah. land creatures. Right. So, of course, they're going to end up in some lower layers. So it makes sense from a biblical perspective. But, yeah, that's the whole what's fact, what's interpretation, what's the biblical explanation of that interpretation, and it tends to fit the facts better. Right, so if you, if you picture a worldwide flood is the thing that is laying down these sedimentary layers. What's getting buried first? The things at the bottom of the ocean. What's getting buried next? The other things in the ocean, then the things that are near the shore, then things that are on the shore, and that it just is an order of burial during the flood. It's not a hundreds of millions of years process. So we're looking at the same evidence, but interpreting that differently because of our worldviews. And it's important for people to understand that because we're often accused of, you're just ignoring the science. No, we're actually looking at the exact same data that you are, but we have a different interpretation because of our starting point. We start with the word of God, the word of the one who knows all things and does not lie and told us what he did. So, all right, well, let's head to Michigan for a couple of articles here to close things out. We've got University of Michigan medical students walk out of pro-life speaker's keynote address at white coat ceremony. So you had a uh, pro-life speaker who was invited to speak, not on that topic, but just to address the students that day. And this is the day I believe that they're also taking their Hippocratic Oath where they're talking about how they promise to protect and value life. And then you have dozens of students who walk out of that ceremony the same day that they're promising to value life because you have a speaker who is known to be pro-life. You guys see anything? Irony in that. Hypocritical. I'm not trying to make a, <laughs> not trying to make a pun with Hippocratic. Okay, I'm trying to avoid that. But um, <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, it's it's um one of those things where she's not even being si silenced because of what she wants to talk about, but because of what she thinks. Um, and she should have the right, first of all, to speak what she has an opinion on. Um, but they're even protesting the fact that she is believing something. So the amount of if, if things like that begin to take place, that's going to be a really, really scary place. Now, for right now, the president of the university is quoted as saying, um, the critical importance of diversity of personal thought and ideas, which is foundational to academic freedom and excellence, is so they did not um, ban her from speaking. That's why she was allowed to speak. So uh, we still are letting them talk. So I just hope that that continues as well. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, so, the, you know, kudos to the school for allowing her to, con to speak because we know there's other places that have shut down speakers like that just because you have a few dozen students who protest. Well, you know what, the students need to learn to hear people who have different opinions, different yeah. ideas, and, mm -hmm. and learn to, uh, to think through that in a, in, a, in a thoughtful and a constructive way rather than just trying to instantly silence them or to run out because you're offended or something. In a free society, you should have a, an exchange of, of I, an open exchange of ideas, and that's how you're going to really grow in many ways. Yeah, and again, it shows you that it's not really about diversity and equality. It's about conformity to a certain set of religious values that the culture happens to hold. I'll mention just really briefly just the fact that it was the Hippocratic Oath. The original one back from, like, supposedly the ancient Greeks, um, actually one of the lines in it is that they're not going to give a woman a device to have an abortion. Mm -hmm. So that was the Greeks, the like the pagan Greeks, and now we've gone even further back in history in our culture to something more like the ancient Canaanites who did child sacrifice to idols. Now it'd be, say, the idols of convenience and security and that sort of thing. That's not progressive. That's actually profoundly regressive. But that's what we see in um, even verses like Jeremiah 7.24. They did not 
obey or incline their ear, but walk in the dictates and counsels and stubbornness of their evil hearts, they went backwards and not forward. So we see that throughout history. When a culture rejects God's word and starts following their heart, you end up going backwards. But Satan calls it progressive because he switches labels on things because he's a liar. Mm. Yeah, and you had you know, kings in, in, in ancient Israel, in, in Judah. You had Asa and Manasseh who sacrificed their children to Molech, you know, sacrificed them in the fire. And so you had evil kings doing evil things. And... They were condemned for it, and the nation was judged for it. So staying in Michigan, um, and this is Governor Whitmer vows to keep abortion legal in Michigan for my kids and your kids. Anybody see some irony in there? Now, this, this, speaking of ironic, this is the same governor who during the shutdown two years ago, her husband tried to rent a boat for the weekend so that they could go out on the lake, and yet nobody was allowed to go anywhere or do anything. But the governor's supposed to be able to, so it's not for thee, but it's okay for me. I mean, it's a hypocritical and double standard is what she wants. But can you imagine keeping abortion legal for your kids, for my kids and your kids? And Right. Yeah, even in addition to the irony, it's just like, okay, what kind of society are you asking for for the future? If it is founded on this belief that um, people should be allowed to honestly like dismember kids for the sake of personal convenience, is that the, what, what kind of society are you asking for? It's one where human rights are not based on whether you're a human, it's on whether someone who has a louder voice in society wants you to live, problem one. It's a society where the right to convenience for some humans trumps the right to life for all humans, problem two. And it's a society where brutal violence is considered moral. So do we want the society for future generations? Like, so she wants to... to make she, sure your kids can kill their kids. She wants to make sure that her kids can kill her grandkids. Right, right, right. That's what Think she's about saying. that. That's yeah, what she's right. saying. Yeah, that's exactly what she just said. It's, it's very tragic. It's sad that we have uh, leaders in this nation who... That's their mindset. We should be valuing all life from the moment of fertilization. You know, we have uh, resources on the, on the sanctity of life. We've got a, a, an exhibit called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. We're gonna be opening up a permanent exhibit of that that is much larger uh, in just a couple of months now, actually two months from today. Uh, we're gonna be opening that October 8th is our ribbon cutting ceremony and we're looking forward to that. Uh, the exhibit that we currently have is already spectacular but it's gonna be much better if you can imagine that. And uh, so we've got resources on that and on many of these other social issues. Uh, so that is all the time that we have for today. We've gone a little bit long because I am long-winded, but that's okay. You guys, thanks for sticking with us, and we'll see you next time on Answers News. Thank you.